Welcome everyone to About 15 Can't Miss Commands in DBA Tools 1.0. My name is Christy Lemaire and I am an automation engineer with GDIT at NATO Special Ops Headquarters in Belgium. I actually got my title changed just in like the last two weeks and I'm super proud. Thank you. Thank you. I, just, I just put it out into the universe and they're like, okay, makes sense. So I'm also a PowerShell and SQL Server MVP and a PowerShell community hero. And it's just such an honor um, to be recognized by both Microsoft and the community. So thank you to everyone who helped make that happen. All right, so in this session, uh, we're gonna highlight some PowerShell commands that are going to simplify your life and practically do your dishes. They're super awesome. And on the agenda, I'm gonna give an overview of the pretty long journey to DBA Tools 1.0, and then we're gonna have demos galore. So back in the beginning, uh, July 2014, I was tasked with migrating a SharePoint SQL Server instance. So if any of you know about SharePoint, it creates about 50 databases per form. And they're like, hey, can we do a migration and upgrade everything? And I was like, all right, I'm gonna do it. And I'm an automator and this is already done in PowerShell. And so I'm just gonna you know, get on the internet and shock everyone. And then it wasn't. And there were, there were snippets, but it was like static paths. You know, so you had to type in E colon backslash MSSQL. I wanted dynamic stuff. So I created something that helped me and I put it on Script Center, and then I also threw it onto GitHub. And you'll notice here that I, um, I named it start SQL migration.ps1 because I have a background in Linux and in VBS, and people are like, put this in a module. And I was like, why? I'm gonna execute a command just to execute another command? And so I just kept it PS1 for a while, uh, but then, in September of 2015, so over one year later, I started adding a bunch of other commands into this. Uh, they were complementary, right? So like get SQL product key, things that would help you do a migration. And I started to see the value, thank you for the nods. And I started to see the value of adding, it, uh, adding these commands to a module. And now I'm completely in love with modules. And this was a bit of conference-driven development. The reason that it's sep September 2015 um, is because I, I had this really awesome tool and I needed people to know. And so I put it into a module and then I went and I presented about DBA tools for the first time uh, in 2015. Okay. And so about nine months later, we created the SQL Server Community Slack, uh, which can now be found at aka.ms slash SQL Slack, which is super neat and cool. Um, we have over 9,000 community members there and 2,000 in DBA tools alone. But back then in 2016, there are about 20 of us. And uh, Claudio Silva actually um, gave us the first external command. He was the first major contributor and he gave us expand SQL T log responsibly. And then Rob Sewell then gave us the second command from an external contributor and that was remove SQL database safely. And then from there it just kind of exploded. And I know it looks like Jared Atkinson is one of our contributors, but he's just not yet. So 1.0. DBA Tools 1.0 officially began over two and a half years ago in January of 2017. And um, it was pretty cool. We had this distributed group of developers that came together. We together. And, uh, you know, whenever we're accepting commands from everybody, there's no standards going on. And we decided we want this to be enterprise and we want it to be awesome. So we all agreed on a whole bunch of standards. And this is what we decided on using Trello and Slack and all of these tools. The first is that we wanted to standardize documentation. So in some commands, there would be, you know, like SQL instance would be a SQL server that you want to connect to. And another one would be the target SQL server instance. And we wanted that to be just standard across the board because that's really what you expect out of a professional module. 
The next one is that we wanted to standardize the names for parameters and commands and things like that. And we moved from that SQL prefix to the DBA prefix to make sure that we didn't have any clashes with Microsoft naming. And um, it took a moment, like, so I'm the BDFL for the project. That's the benevolent dictator for life. And <laughs> it's a common term in the open source world, but I, I do pride myself in being as open-minded as possible. Although it's sometimes it'll take a couple days or a couple weeks, but everybody was like, Chrissy, you need to stop naming your parameters plurally. Like, so I was like, listen, the SQL Server community, how are they gonna know that Dash databases accepts multiple databases unless it's plural? And people are like, examples. And I was like, fine, okay. So we made it singular, but I just didn't feel it in my heart until I was talking to Alexander and he's like, Chrissy, you know who else breaks PowerShell best practices to increase user adoption? Azure RM. And, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I feel it, I feel it now. This is all singular and this is what we're gonna do. So. <laughs> And that really actually did, did change my life. So we also wanted to standardize the outputs. And um, this is things like whenever you use a SQL Server command within DBA tools, you're gonna get computer name every time. You're gonna get instance name and SQL instance and things like that. Oh, for the commands, um, for those we had things like, you know, some people would use path, uh, or actually parameters, some people would use path, some people would use backup directory, and now I know it's not a database collection that's being piped in, it's input object. And it's not a directory, it's path. And it's not like files, it's file path. And so I wanted to give that to you guys in case you were wondering, because it took me way too many years to figure that out. Next, we added pester and app bear, which was super awesome. So initially we added these pester tests that were unit tests. Then I came here to PSConf EU, and I watched Andre Common and Rob Sewell present about um, actually starting up SQL Server instances in the cloud, running all of our commands against that, and that, that really changed everything. Instead of one dude running the commands whenever he had time to make sure that the PR would pass, we had this automated system, and that led us to do like far more testing and far more bug fixes. And ultimately, this is what I love, we started releasing more um, often because we had the confidence to do so. And I was so confident that in November of 2017, I had a session with Rob called Introducing DBA Tools 1.0. So this has been, it's become an ongoing joke, but I will say Gmail took like four to five years to get out of beta and uh, it's a pretty good product. Now, now, we literally have a pre-release branch and a release date. So on June 20th at Data Grillin', we will be debuting DBA Tools 1.0. And everything that you can see here, this is off of the pre-release branch in GitHub. And so if you like any of it, you can get it there. Now we have over 160 contributors and PowerShell itself has about 261, not that I'm counting. And it's, it's amazing that they have 101 more in there, you know, Microsoft, and this is a community project uh, for a group of users that really pushed back on PowerShell for quite a number of years. Also, so back in the day, I really wanted, I wanted my own open source project. I was on Fresh Meat in the 90s. I was on Slashdot and I was like, this shit's cool. I want one of my own. So whenever DBA Tools, um, it, whenever it premiered, it was like GPL because that's, you know, that's, some, that's the cool stuff that, that Linus Torvalds used. And then it turned out that it was too restrictive and it was preventing adoption. So now, um, as of sometime last year, DBA Tools is um, MIT. Also, I thought it loaded three times faster and I got on Twitter and I told everybody, oh, we just switched it and we put like the mammal in one file and we put the other stuff in the other file and now it's so much faster, but I was mistaken. And I wanna take this time to clarify that it's just that my machine is three times faster than, um, <laughs> <laughs> than everybody else's. <laughs> 
So we also now support Azure a bit better, and this is going to be in the demo. Um, and as of sometime in December, thanks to Fred, thanks to Microsoft, and thanks to Mateus, we now run on PowerShell Core, and 75% of our commands run on Mac and Linux. And the ones that don't, it's like SIM and WMI, and then a couple that have path issues um, that we haven't got around to resolving. So that's really, really exciting and fun. And it runs in Azure Functions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to add that. And so even though we're, you know, we're forward, right, we're supporting Azure, we're supporting PowerShell on Linux, we still support PowerShell 3 because this did begin as a migration module. And who needs migrations more than the people, you know, that are stuck on SQL Server 2000, the people that are stuck on Windows 7. And it's really easy and fun um, to program for PowerShell 3, unlike PowerShell 2. So it'll probably just be this way the rest of our lives. I'm like 41 now, so probably like next 20 years. All right, and, and still, it does support SQL Server 2000 mostly. And of course, if something isn't supported in 2000, we can't, um, we can't automatically add that in or magically add it in. But we do try as much as we can. And DBA Tools 1.0 is actually going to have an accompanying meet, which is the Manning Early Access Program. So Rob Sewell and I, are creating the book DBA Tools in a month of lunches, which is so awesome because that's the same publishing company that made PowerShell in a month of lunches and the same company that made my favorite book in the world, PowerShell in Action. So we're super excited. This is going to be out in July and um, the final book will probably be sometime early next year. All right, so now we're going to get to the demo. In the demo grouping, we're going to have some classics. We're going to have some must-haves. These, these are the things that I wanted in DBA tools before we went to 1.0. We're going to have some fan favorites, like whenever people lose their minds, I threw that in there. And then also the combo kills that really show the power of PowerShell. So let's get to the demo. And how much time am, am I at? I have like a time. How much? I'm at 12. That is so perfect. Thank you. That's four less than last night and the day before. So I always have these breaks. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reset this and because I went the wrong way and I couldn't tell how much time it was. Say done. And I want to do the Skype watch. So now I have like, like 40 minutes left, I would say. 20, what? Right, but that's all the way to, and she's going to yell at me if I do it all the way to 4-7, so I'm just going to go 4-2. <laughs> all right, so. Yes. Okay, so the first thing, I always start with a break. I learned this from Alexander, and this is if you accidentally hit that, this button, the wrong one. It's not going to break everything, so if you do your own presentations, it's fabulous to have there. And here are the basics. So the first one that I'm going to cover is get DBA registered server. And how many of you are DBAs or, or data SQL server professionals here? Okay, a, li a little bit. All right. Um, how many of you are familiar of those that just raised your hand or sorry, of those of you that didn't raise your hands? How many of you are familiar with registered servers? Okay, cool. That's really nice. So registered servers for the SQL Server community are really cool because they help us keep our inventory all in one place. And it looks like this. So you have SQL Server Management Studio, and you have these local server groups, and then um, Azure Data Studio, this suddenly appeared. Um, and I was like, what is this? I need to support it. So it's SSMS um, 2018, or sorry, SSMS 18. And if you have Azure Data Studio, then it'll add it in there. And then you also have the central management servers. Um, and so local server groups in Azure Data Studio, they're saved on your hard drive. With local server groups, that's, um, it's encoded, whereas Azure Data Studio is stored in the credential store. And that was a lot of fun to figure out and work with. 
Um, and the reason that, that this command is the first one is because I was just writing chapter eight and it was about central management server, right? But I needed to explain this concept. And I'm going through, and I'm like, here's local server groups, but we don't support them. And here's Azure Data Studio, but we don't support it. And I was like, this makes this book boring. So, <laughs> so I added in support in like the past two weeks, and this is now in, um, in the pre-release branch. And the differences between local server groups and central management servers, it's really cool. Because it's stored on your drive, you can authenticate and you can save your authentication in any type of way. So Windows, SQL, um, you, you know, know Azure, Azure directory, directory with, with MFA, MFA that's that Wait, whereas with the central management servers, that's really not the case because it is stored in a centralized, this is stored in MSDB on the SQL server itself. So they don't want to store the credentials. And the only thing that it supports is Windows authentication and then Active Directory integrated. So we recently added support, very exciting. So get DBA registered server, that's actually an alias. To me in my head, that's what I always type out. So there are about four aliases left. Everything else has been removed. We had a lot of SQL aliases because we used to call you know, everything dash SQL. And so you can call this by get DBA reg server or get DBA registered server. So you can see here that if you execute it without a SQL instance, that it has all of your registered servers. And what's very cool about this is you can pipe it to any SQL server command, um, or sorry, any DBA tools command, and it'll support it. So this is what it looks like whenever you, um, whenever you use a, a central management server, and that is localhost SQL 2016, so it'll connect there. And then I also said include local, so that it looks more like this. So we have localhost 2016, and this is a bit what the, um, what the output is gonna look like. And if you're wondering why Azure and then Docker and on-prem, I wanted to highlight, uh, I, did, um, I did a survey of DBAs and like, how do you store your CMS stuff? And, and the answer is, of course, it depends. Um, some people will actually switch around their registered servers depending on if they are performing a migration. So they have, you know, 2012 or they'll have it by enterprise edition and so on. Some people do dev prod test, on-prem, Azure, and so on. So those are some ideas if, um, if you're looking to use this because it is a really exciting feature and not a lot of people know about it. And to show you how we support it, if you just go here and this, what this does is it gets the group. So all of the on-prem um, SQL servers, and then it pipes that to get DBA database, and then we select the instance from there. And I was told to make it this big. Is this too big for everyone, or is this okay? That's good back there? All right, okay, I'll leave it like this. So we have the on-prem group, and that is here. So it'll grab all of these, and I chose this because it has the lowest latency, and it's super fast. And so um, yeah, it'll grab all of those. So you can do it by batches, and then manage all of your SQL servers that way. And while adding support for this, I'm so, so excited to announce that DBA Tools 1.0 is going to support every authentication uh, method possible with SQL Server. So whenever you go here, this was my dream, right? I wanted to come here and go to properties and I wanted to have all the things that SQL Server Management Studio does. And we now support MFA multi-factor authentication within DBA tools. We support Windows authentication. We support Azure Active Directory. So any way that you wanna log into your SQL servers is now supported. And this is gonna take just a little second because um, I'm actually connected over my cell phone. But this is going out to Azure. And notice that there's no username or password or anything. This is just gonna go and connect to the instance. It'll probably take, there we go, what up? Mm. So that's really exciting. It was actually a ton of fun to program this. Um, I was having issues with SQL management objects losing my token, and the SQL tools team actually helped us over Twitter and in Slack. Um, and what's extra cool is that Microsoft's official module SQL server still doesn't support uh, MFA yet, and DBA tools does. <laughs> Thank you guys. 
Uh, this, so this is interesting. The next one that we're going to look at is importing massive CSVs. And this is really what got me into PowerShell besides SharePoint. So a long time ago, so I was like, hey, can you please take these 9 million rows and put it into SQL Server? And a lot of the SQL Server tools were unreliable. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll just do this in PowerShell. It'll be super easy. And then what I learned from it, I actually presented here at PSConf EU. And um, it was like how I can get 250,000 rows per second in a SQL Server. And... Um, and I learned a lot from it, and then I turned it into a command called import DBA CSV to SQL. And, um, and what I learned from this, because I kept getting issues, what I learned was that I had actually programmed, unfortunately, against a perfect CSV file. And so whenever people had these imperfect CSV files and their imperfect data, then all their stuff would fail. And so every time we would get these issues, and it got so bad that even though I had done a presentation about this method, I never used it. So instead, what I did was I wanted to focus on reliability instead of pure speed. And by the, reason, by the way, the reason that it was so fast is because there was no error handling. And what's really the use of that? So what I have here, and I made, all, I made this PowerShell as well. So we have these CSVs, and one of them is no proper delimiter, so it's going to fail. But you take that and you just pipe it. You take this whole directory of all weird data, and you pipe it into import DBA CSV, and you specify the instance, the database, you can auto-create the tables. And then for anybody using the encoding, I had messed it up before, and now in 1.0, it's just gonna be as easy as UTF-8 instead of actually enumeration. Um, but we could take this and then execute it. It will import all of these weird, imperfect CSVs in the way that I did it, even though it's slower, is because I used an open source um, library called LumenWorks, and that takes care of all of the streaming that I don't know how to do. It takes care of all of the error handling, and most importantly, it takes care of the reliability, so it's not frustrating to use anymore, which is super exciting. And then we still have, I do count the rows per second, so we did go down, you know, from 250,000 rows a second to 35,000, but at least it's in the database now. And by the way, Yes, it does work if you import CSV and then pipe that to write DBA data table. Um, this is great for larger data sets, um, and, and so is the other one, but this makes it just a one-liner and it's super easy. So we can look, whenever we use invoke DBA query, we can see that it is certainly there. So the next section that we'll be looking at is the must-haves, these are the things that I absolutely wanted in DBA Tools 1.0, and I'm really excited about it. The first one is Find DBA Instance. And I love it because um, anytime that you start uh, at a new place, as a DBA, I would go and I'd be like, all right, so I'm here to manage. Tell me what I'm managing. And they're either like, okay, will you figure it out? Or they're like, here's a crappy CSV file with like just some IPs and some backup locations. And I'm like, what about the version? What about like the addition? What about the databases? What about the applications? And then I have literally never been to a place where they've given you a complete list. So every single time I get permission from the network team and then I run about five different GUIs because before I started my current jobs, um, I didn't have PowerShell and I didn't have Find DBA instance. So instead of running these five different GUIs, each of which finds a subset of SQL servers, now you can use Find DBA instance, which will search. So, ooh, you saw what I just did. So, which will search SPNs. It'll do some UDP broadcast lookups, which is super cool. It will find SQL services through SQL WMI. It has a whole bunch of different ways to discover, and it has a whole bunch of different ways to scan. And you can see here that it found all three of my SQL servers on this laptop. And I want to highlight that, so this was, um, this was originally part of a module called Power Up SQL. It's a, it's a module for the red teams that used to attack SQL Server, and in order to attack it, you want to find it. 
And um, I asked Scott Sutherland of NetSpy if he would donate this command to us. And he was like, yeah, so he submitted it. And then I asked Fred Weinman, I was like, hey, can you take this and make it like extra fast and awesome? So then he made it into C Sharp and this is executing a whole bunch of C-sharp behind the scenes. And we just wanna say that if you run this on your network and you're like, I know that's a SQL server and it didn't find it, please let us know because it is our goal to find every single SQL server instance on your network. So thank you, Fred, for that contribution. The next one is super cool, it's PII management. So this is especially important with this DevOps world, right? You have a bank or a healthcare system that has data um, on production and then they give it to their devs and then they put on their laptop and then they go to Starbucks and then they leave it open and somebody steals it. And what this will do is uh, finding your PII and then masking that PII with fake data, that was something that I wanted in DBA tools because it was something that I needed. I was asked to give a database to a vendor, but first I had to clean it. Then I had to collect all of that information, all of the PII, and then I had to download some commercial product and see if it worked. And then we'd have had to go through a procurement process that who, who knows how long that's gonna take. And what I love about this is that now it's all built into DBA tools. And it was actually a lot of fun <clears throat> to work through this. So this was created by Sander Stodd. This will perform a PII scan against your databases. You could specify all your databases, specific tables and so on, but it does a whole bunch of regex comparisons. And, um, and he actually put a PR out there, or sorry, an issue asking, we have Dutch covered, we have USA covered for things like social security numbers and so on. But if your country isn't covered, get in touch with us and then we can add that there. And you can see it found likely PII candidates, things like you know name, email, state, country, national ID number, IP address, and so on. So what you could do is you can take this and run it against these, um, these tables. So with the masking, what you first wanna do, and this was actually kind of fun to actually program. First, we would create the masking configuration and it'll go through and it'll export like likely things. And by the way, what we do is we execute this against another open source library called Bogus. It originally started as this JavaScript thing and then they made it into a C-sharp thing and now we took that DLL and we run um, all of this using PowerShell. So this is what it outputs and it guesses and it has cool stuff like this. So job title is an exciting bit like login ID. It'll say the masking type is internet and the subtype is username. And so it has some guesses, right? You go through there. And this is um, the one that I actually created. So after that, you go through, and it does require some manual intervention. You go through and you're like, you know what? The birth date, the person can only be born between these two dates. Sorry, Tyler. <laughs> um, you know, with married and single, it's just MF, uh, MS. Um, and then from there, what you do is you run it against this command called invoke DBA DB data masking. And so this will perform the actual masking. And it was fun. I actually did a, a nine hour live stream where I, I, I ran this. It was exhausting. I'm still tired. <laughs> I ran this and it took one minute. And I was like, I'm not going to sit there for one minute and pretend that this is acceptable. And so for, for nine hours, it was actually, I found it in the first four hours, but then I wanted to get better and I didn't. Um, so what I did was I, um, I fixed one of the underlying commands and then from there, it's pretty cool, I love this. So it'll prompt you, I'm masking these columns in this many rows in this database. So you say yes. And from there, it masked all of that. So now you can take this mass data, it's no longer real. So Chrissy Lemaire, let's say that my name was in here. Chrissy Lemaire no longer exists in this database. Now it's just John Doe. And that's just, I think it's getting more and more important with GDPR and it's getting more and more important with all of those data breaches and I'm tired of having my data breached. So the next thing, this was a very, this was a very long time coming. Um, the VLDB migration. So VLDB means very large database and that's, Rob, what would you say? One terabyte is big? 
Yes. Oh, okay. Ooh, see, I'm just doing like 200 gigs. I'm too tiny. But in my environment, it's acceptable for me to have eight hours of downtime, which I love. Um, <laughs> so, thank you, job. Thank you. <laughs> And so I have, you know, I can do, I can take eight hours and I can migrate my, my 20 gig database, but not everybody can. And what we want is minimal downtime. And there's a different, there's a bunch of different ways to approach that in SQL Server. And we figured that way out. So with, this is another command by Sander Stodd. It sets up log shipping. And what's really cool about this is that it's going from localhost is SQL Server 2008 R2. And SQL 2017, oops, no, oh God, how do I get out of this? No. So, and, and localhost SQL 2017 is just that, SQL 2017. So this, what's really cool is it'll set it up. Man, I don't know if you ever tried to set this up in SSMS, but I got so frustrated because it kept failing that I was like, Sander, can you please just make a command for this? So he did. And, you know, instead of going through all of those clicks, it takes nine seconds to get log shipping set up. Now imagine it's time to move to the new database. All you have to do is you, you recover whenever you're ready. So during this time, it's taking those, all those transactions and it's moving it to the new server and it's shipping it out and shipping it out. And when you're ready, you're like, okay, I'm ready. Let's do a recovery and you just execute this one command. It'll do its copy job. It'll do its restore job. So right now it's copying over those real last bits of data. Now it's doing that last restore and then it's setting it to be a properly recovered database. So in 14 seconds, you can migrate one instance to the other and that's super cool. The next one, a lot of people ask this, I know the DSC can do this, but a lot of, it takes a lot of work. Um, it's kind of challenging. Um, and we wanted an interface for whenever you, you know, run an update for SQL Server and you hit next, 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 next. Well, we, <laughs> we wanted that, look, 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 no, so we used to do that, but now we make PowerShell hit next, 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 next. <laughs> So we have install DBA instance and update DBA instance. And we use the things that Microsoft wants us to use, like a configuration file. But what PowerShell does is it makes that configuration file for you. So it just makes it a lot less tedious and it does it in a powershell -y way. So because I can't update my current server, um, what I'm going to do is show you, all you have to do is type in the computer name and the path, and I love this. It will find all of the SQL Server instances on there, and then it will see if their updates are available in the path specified. And then it will prompt you if you want it. So this was made by Kirill. He has the coolest name, Inbar Scar. Um, and this is what it'll do. So it'll prepare. It's looking for what it needs. It found it. You hit yes. It does the extraction. And then it performs the update. And I have used this in production, and it took so that's all. That is all that you have to do to update your SQL Server, and you could do this in batches as well. So that was something that we wanted in 1.0, and now we have it. All right, so some band favorites. Y'all ready to get pumped? How much time do I have left? 20 minutes? Almost 30, okay. So um, we have something in the SQL Server. So you guys... You know, like PowerShell people have VS Code, SQL Server people, we have SQL Server Management Studio and Azure Data Studio. And Azure Data Studio, because um, you know, Microsoft wants to let people know Azure now means both on-prem and in the cloud. So Azure Data Studio is for both on-prem and the cloud. And they introduced something that people are losing their minds over called notebooks. How many of you are familiar with notebooks? Right, I'm not either. <laughs> but it's actually really, really pretty and super cool. So this dude, Spaghetti DBA, John Lucas Sartori, um, whenever the notebooks came out, he took the DBA tools command. We, um, we support, there's this, this, uh, this guy, Glenn Berry, he did a whole bunch of diagnostic scripts that are really useful, especially if you have a, um, like a consultant coming in and you want to know, you want to have a 
good idea of what's going on with your SQL Server, you can run these diagnostic scripts and then have a really good idea of what's going on with the SQL Server. Um, they're very popular within the SQL Server community. And what Spaghetti did was he took all of these scripts and then he put it into a beautiful notebook using PowerShell. And whenever he put this blog post out, like it was retweeted like trillions of times and it was on LinkedIn and everywhere I looked for like two weeks, it was this PowerShell. So I was like, hey, Spaghetti, can we please get this in DBA tools? And he says, yes. So, so he gave it to us. And this is an example. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I think that it's actually something that we're going to become more familiar with. Um, they are Jupyter notebooks. They're made, I guess, by a company called Jupyter, um, and it's very big in the Python world. So what I'm going to do is create one of these notebooks and then call it. And now it's opening in Azure Data Studio. And I mean, first of all, what I love about it is that it's um, whenever you look at it, and what people will do is they'll take this, and you can just give it to an end user, and um, and then, you know, they can run all of this themselves instead of you having to run it and then give them the information. And I'm pretty jealous because Beard is doing his presentations in um, using notebooks and in Azure Data Studio, and I would like to do that. It was my goal. I didn't get there. I was too busy. I was, I was... I was obsessed. I was really obsessed about getting those access tokens and MFA to work. It's awesome. Uh -huh. So it's just really cool and it's really pretty. And um, this is one of the fan favorites. Oh, shit. All right. That's a lot of people. 
So then you know if you're setting up availability groups, you're hitting like next, 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 next. I mean, not anymore, but next, next. And this is actually, so I took a little video of this is, this is the fewest amount of clicks that it takes to set up an availability group, hubs. All right, all right. So that was, this is like the smallest availability group possible, right? That's still like, I don't know what, 15 clicks. And, um, and now what you can do is you can just do it in one command. And I'm really excited for those of you who use uh, SQL Server on Linux and Docker. Um, before you always had to, because right now it only supports, to my knowledge, SQL Server authentication. And so you always have to type in the username and password, and it's kind of a bummer. But with DBA Tools 1.0, we're going to be supporting those different types of authentication. So you can just grab your registered servers, no hassle, all in one. And then, has Docker been reset? Probably. I think so. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. If not, it'll exist. So you just put the, pri the primary and the secondary. This has um, this has created the, um, it's actually using connection strings behind the scenes. And so you take that and then you just execute it. And this will set up availability groups on SQL Server on Linux. Boom, what? Let's go look at this. Okay, so So that's what we have there, and um, hmm. so let's go to our registered servers. And I love this. So Microsoft was really cute, and they added this little this little Linux guy right there. So there's Docker SQL one and Docker SQL two. So this reached out to my MacBook outside of the VM and set it up that way, all in one command. Um, and that was a lot of fun to program, especially because I don't use availability groups. So I was, I was just using the object model to kind of figure out what you have to do along the way. And this is what it looks like. Whenever I first did this and it was expanding, um, the, the, uh, the database wasn't showing up. I was horrified and then it fixed it. So it's in the pre-release branch. If it ever shows up. Good thing I have extra time. What you guys eating tonight? Man, I'm kind of bummed. You know what showed us though? PowerShell. So that's what it looked like over there. All right, so next. Start DBA migration. This started everything. And um, so start DBA migration is a combo kill because it wraps like 30 other Commands. This is not, you know, I need a one login here, I need one database here. If you're moving one SQL Server instance to another SQL Server instance, then that's what Start DBA migration is there for. So here we are going to go from a SQL Server 2008 machine to SQL Server 2012, sorry, 2016. We're going to use the last backup, so it's already created the backups that it needs, and then we're going to exclude some databases, and then we're going to make that good morning action silently continue so that it's not that way. And then we're going to show it to a group. So let's execute this. Actually, you know, I just want to check on it one more time. It's still doing it. Such a bummer. This actually might mean that my entire thing is um, broken, so let me go ahead and restart it while we perform the migration. I do love Google's. Actually, um, <laughs> say what? Sorry. I just installed SQL Server 2018, so maybe that's what it is, or, or SSMS 2018. So now we're going to perform the migration. Um, and what this does is it's super cool because it will, um, it'll copy over your configuration. It will copy over um, your mail accounts, your credentials with the passwords, which is super cool. 
um, because before there's no other tool on the market that does it uh, besides the guy that I use this from. Um, uh, I can't remember his name, Auntie Rontasori from NetSpy. Um, he put that out there. It was FreeBSD license. It was open source. Asked him if we could have it in DBA tools. So we use that to decrypt both the credentials and the linked servers. So you can see here, big old DB didn't have a backup yet. So there's so that failed. But we have the we have all of the databases. We have the CMS instances. So that's the central management servers that are being migrated. It'll work with jobs. It'll work with operators. It'll work for the entire SQL Server, which I'd wanted to show you around once this reopens. So here are the logins coming in. I have a, so this is really cool. It, it's, it's so fast now to migrate SQL Server instances. Literally two weeks ago, I was performing one and it was taking about 25 minutes. And one of the systems engineers was like, Chrissy, is something wrong? because he was like, you're usually done by now. And I was like, say it again. <laughs> it was, it was, I was like, well, now the only thing wrong is that this migration has a little bit more data, but I'll be done in about five minutes. But I thought that that was so amazing that he's like, is everything okay? Because back in the day, man, it would take just days to migrate a SQL Server instance. So let me look here on Prim. So we went to, we migrated to, what was it? 2016, 2016. So we can see here, when we go through the Object Explorer, all of the databases are there. All of these, so this was a SQL Server uh, SharePoint instance. Um, all of the logins have been migrated, all of the everything. And before, imagine we were just clicking through, right? Because you can, you can go here and you can, you know, right click and then you can say script and this is what it used to be like for SQL Server DBAs. And it was, I mean, we're really, really happy to have it at the time, but then it became very tedious as the number of, of servers grew. And the last one that I'll be showing here is Export DBA Instance. And I'm particularly excited about this one uh, for a number of reasons. We've had Start DBA migration for a very long time. Um, and everyone asked like, what if, what if the servers are offline? Can you do that? And so I created export DBA instance, which will take all of those objects that you saw being migrated. And instead of performing that live migration, it'll just export the scripts to disk. And this actually saved my butt. Um, we had the weirdest problem with SQL Server. Uh, data kept disappearing. And I'm like, this goes against everything that I know. And I didn't get what was happening. And it turned out that the storage, um, I, it was a cluster. And whenever it would go to this one node, it had these, it had two, I don't know, something iSCSI something. And it would sometimes pick the wrong one. And so every now and then all of our data would disappear. And thank God I had done an export of the entire system so I was able to put it back and then eventually figure that out. So this exports all of everything. We're gonna export it to the temp DR path. And now it's just, this is just, it's like relaxing to watch this happen. It's so good. This is, you know, this is a job saving script right here. And I love it. And if you're wondering about the databases, so this is not going to export your databases, what it'll do is what we used to do back in the day. Um, it will export your restore scripts. So once it's finished, then we'll go ahead and take a look at that. And that's what it looks like for this. There's not a lot of activity on this machine, but if there was, imagine it goes through your full, it goes through your diffs, and it goes through your logs, and it, it does that. So it's up to the very, very last bit of data that you have when you perform these exports. And something that's very exciting about this particular script, so I work for General Dynamics Information Technology, and just recently PowerShell and DBA Tools was actually featured in one of their newsletters. And so, because they were highlighting one of the conferences that I did for disaster recovery. And so it just really, it worked out for everyone because companies want to, you know, appear forward whenever it comes to things like disaster recovery. 
And then we had some power chill in there. So that was exciting. And that wraps up the current demo. I did, oh, actually, no, we have one more thing. So um, as we're going through and we're doing these standardizations and we're changing the names from SQL to DBA and we're changing the names from things like configurations to configs or like config to oral configs, as we're going through and renaming everything, um, I was like, ooh, that would be a big burden. So what we have created is something called the Invoke DBA Tools Rename Helper. And so what this will do is it will rename all the things that you need in your scripts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of our community presentations. Glad you like that, man. So we're going to go through all of our community ah, presentations. And what is happening? Is anybody sitting there? Say what? Okay. Oh, you're right. I'm on the super phone. It was doing what I was telling it to do. Stupid computer. So here we go. So it takes that pattern that it finds and then it will replace it. And if we go and we open up GitHub, because this is stored in GitHub, we will see, check that out, all of those presentations have been updated. So you can run the rename helper on your own um, scripts at your own job and welcome DBA Tools 1.0. Thank you. Very excited. Does anybody have any questions? There's like a couple of hundred functions in here. How do you find your way around it all? Thank you so much for that question. So the way that I do it, I go to DBA Tools. Oh, thank you. Okay, so he asked, he said, there's so many, there's so many commands. How do I navigate and find all of them? Um, we do have a command called find DBA command, but this is my favorite way to do it. Um, if you go to the command index, um, our page isn't dark. Hold on, let me turn off this really awesome Chrome plugin called Dark Reader. And so um, you go here and this has, it's kind of lined up. Um, and it has the groups like, you know, if you want to work with availability groups, you could click that. If you want to work with log shipping, you can click that and it'll go down to this area. And so that's the way that I um, navigate. If you use find DBA command, that will also search the synopsis. Uh, so regular find command just finds it on the, the command name. But if you use find DBA command, it'll actually look at the synopsis and other areas as well. Any other questions? No, no. Ha ha ha! Well, since it's been five years, he <laughs> was that. Oh, the question is, what's the plan for 2.0? There's no plan. I don't want to let people down. <laughs> so thank you all for joining. My name is Chris Lumaire, and you guys have been a pleasure.